If you're a millennial, chances are the term conspiracy theory has long been in your vernacular. And this term, this concept, this idea is oftentimes used, as we know, we have become unfortunately quite intimately aware of its use in conversation as both a dismissal and a call for what might it be, but in action. And that is the hint, the tip of this iceberg today, as we're going to talk about why conspiracy theories are dangerous, and it probably isn't in the way that you're thinking. But if we were to do so, if we were to probably try to do so from a quote, a proper philosophical standpoint, we'd have to start by defining a conspiracy theory. And instead of doing that, instead of just starting with definitions, I want to look at what they do to us and what consequences we might suffer when we are captured by these idea ideas. Now, I am not the first person to say that uh, people don't have ideas. Ideas have people. It has gone through psychologists and sociologists and various people of that types, including Jordan Peterson, and I believe Carl Jung. But even as we address the idea of a conspiracy theory, I want you to be able to keep a little bit of an open mind, but also a moment, take a moment to consider how these things might be hurting yourself or ourselves. And so certainly now after in the aftermath of an attempt to, uh, uh, or an attempt on the life of Donald Trump, the, uh, the internet is rife with the use of the phrase conspiracy theory and also what might actually have been the case, what might actually have took place when it comes to the attempted assassination of Donald Trump, but, and, or not even, but rather, and this, it serves an, as an opportunity to not to take a, a, a break from the madness that is the internet right now, whether it's social media or so on and so forth, and consider how it is we think about the world. In fact, the issue with a conspiracy theory might actually be that it is a worldview that is masquerading or taking advantage of one's it's an artificial worldview that takes advantage of one's desire for a sense of meaning in this world. Think of the caricatures of people that are portrayed across media as the conspiracy theorist. They are so committed to this idea that it gives them their very life, their very sense of meaning. And before I spoil the rest of the episode, I am going to bring up this show's sponsor. Now, if you might wonder what do conspiracy theories have to do with the idea of gun culture, have no fear. We will get to that. Before we do, I want to bring up this show sponsor, which is Obsidian Arms. Or whether you are looking at being more on the self-sufficient and proficient at maintenance side, and you're interested in a series of punches and tools for the development or maintenance or building of your own firearms in that sense they're not kits don't worry about it uh those but those tools come with a lifetime warranty or you have been working hard on a product that might want you might want to bring to market make it a reality these are just two of the many things of the many facets of gun culture that obsidian arms is part of and so if you are interested in them or you want to support the show head over to obsidianarms.com. And beyond that, you can support us by going over to redactedllc.com, check out our shop, see what patches and stickers and shirts that we have available. And now on with conspiracy theories. So if I can try to get you to share this with your friends, let's start here. In today's description, we are going to talk about two different genomes of the conspiracy theory. Now, these are not scientifically official terms, but they're going to be useful for today. The first one is ordo religiosness, or ordo, what might we call ordo religiosness, or ordo religio, religios, religionis, ordo religionis or the order of the religions. And this type of conspiracy theory is going to fit the description of something like what James Lindsay talks about with cultural Marxism. <clears throat> and this type of conspiracy theory is very clearly a worldview that orders all of reality more than just a perspective, but it, it is oftentimes unconscious, but so often and, and sometimes conscious, a 
pers- something deeper than a perspective that informs somebody about the order of the world. And it, this is where we get these ideas of you know, whiteness or white supremacy, or even you could even talk about race essentialism. And, and what I think this type of a, um, or the, the, uh, right at, the, at the current time, even though it's now m- not nearly at its peak as it used to be, the uh, organization or this, this idea formerly known as Black Lives Matter, or currently known as Black Lives Matter, very well fits this description. It is a orienting and understanding and organizing of the world, or one's place in the world, as part of a struggle between these things. It is between uh, the people and whiteness, or whatever the evil is. And it creates a sense of meaning and purpose to one striving against whatever it is that's considered evil. There's a reason why this type of conspiracy theory very oftentimes resembles all the trappings of a religion. You'll have common practices, common phrases, people of different positions of honor, or even uh, almost like holiness, really good example, which is convenient to this time, is that uh, during the, it was a, it was about the year of 2021, and I was living in the warm, red-hot city of Minneapolis. And for some reason, at uh, this time, we decided, me and one other person, decided to go to the location where George Floyd had died. And as we uh, approached the area, the, the location where it happened, and I'm not talking about the neighborhood, I'm talking about the actual intersection and area, uh, we came across a shrine. And that shrine had a woman who I'm going to assume, I, I, or I have reason to believe that she was on some sort of um, narcotics, uh, referred to herself as the high priest. Now, was she, you know, ordained by the Church of the Black Lives Matter? No, but she just said she said that this was holy ground and that everyone needed to take their shoes off. And you had, if you're familiar with Old Testament history, basically a tabernacle built up at the location of George Floyd's death. There was an outer ring where anyone could enter, and then an inner ring where you had to be of a certain uh, skin color to approach the holy of holies being the death site of George Floyd. And so this is an example of how this worldview of a conspiracy theory can capture somebody and it can give some sense of meaning and direction to the chaos of the world. Now, why do I call this the kind of the ordo-religious or the ordo-religionous type of conspiracy theory? Well, it, why... I wanted to start with this one is because it's a good way of helping to introduce the idea of what a worldview is. And it gets more important here because this is only one way or one part of how a a, a quote-unquote conspiracy theory could become dangerous. Imagine you have an organization or a a uh, one group of people intent on disrupting another group of people. You have one country that is intent on disrupting and damaging another country's function. And they want to do so without escalating to the level of warfare. What are the options that they have at bay or are at play? Quite are in, in, in our world where we hear phrases like fifth generation warfare, or we see things like cultural war, cyber war, economic war, this kind of ever-present individual level uh, presence or feeling of warfare. Uh, one of the ways that I don't want to necessarily explain it, but give some context to what that might look like. So if there, if you have two countries that are maybe on the surface attempting to present themselves as if they're on good terms, but really underneath, if you look at their governments, they are adversarial to each other. What one government might do is take advantage of some of the belief systems of the other government or the other country. Let's just say the target or the we have um, aggressor come or we have you know the aggressor country and the the uh, the victim country of this sort, even though that's just too too simplified. And so if a country, wants to undermine the stability of another country, one thing that they might look at are what are the cultural norms of that country? Maybe those cultural norms come in the forms of a very dominant religion or worldview of sorts. 
And so then it would be, it could be seen as the advantage of the attacking but not war making country to support or even instigate the, the creation or development of an anti religion in the target country. And that anti religion would not necessarily mysteriously, but they would tend to have values not only opposing to, but antithetical to the cultural norm of the target or now host country. And so like a virus, this fake religion, we'll call it a fake religion because it was produced, um, it was produced um, artificially. In other words, it wasn't that the, the idea of it was intended to begin with as it wasn't genuine from its start, but rather was artificially created and then planted in a foreign country, uh, the artificial religion might suffer by having true believers in its ranks. And so you could imagine the devious country, the, the, in, the infiltrating country, planting, sending missionaries to another country in order to have those quote-unquote missionaries undermine the well-being of the other country by uh, creating strife amongst its population. Now, where does this become a conspiracy theory? That is one way of describing what, how this religion might function. It might weaponize and direct and, 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 and harness or uh, capitalize, in a dark sense, on the pre-existing resentment of various individuals within that culture. A perfect example of this, which is, this is again what we're talking about, the kind of fifth generation warfare thing, or ideological and information warfare. A good example of this are the opening chapters of Jamil Giovanni's book, Why Young Men, where organizations in the area that he grew up with would find young men who are disaffected and disconnected from their community and weaponize them with an ideology that they themselves would not even practice. And so thus you can find angry, disconnected young men who don't have a direction life and give them a sense of direction by informing them that they are the oppressed and anything which goes against them is the oppressor. And where this form of conspiracy theory leaves what I'm going to start with as we're building this model of conspiracy theory, and I'm going to push off to something that is much more religious, is that it oftentimes organizes the self as the saving hero, the Messiah of sorts. We are the Messiah. We are God. I believe in, you know, whatever, identity without an essence, and so on and so forth. And so this form of a conspiracy theory is something that argues that all those who do not, who are not actively supporting your well-being are somehow actively like, opposing you. They are, by anyone not affirming your worldview, they must be trying to to oppress you. It simplifies the world, and we've heard this many times, into the oppressors and the oppressed, or the, you know, the these and the those, and the so long and so forth. And so this form of conspiracy theory is particularly dangerous because it takes, it, it, um, it seizes on the already existing frustrations of a people, and it pushes them in a direction and justifies them to use violence, which is why we oftentimes see people who believe in these conspiracy theories partake in a low-level violence that doesn't quite reach the level of being, let's say, policed well. And it is, and it and this is the nature of that type of conspiracy theory, to make a mob angry and send them in a direction. Not really, it's not whether or not someone's concerned about the outcome is really unimportant. The conspiracy theory element of this one is that it is formed, it is baked in the form of a worldview that you are being oppressed for who you are and that there is a world out there, a utopia that would be achievable if only you rose up and broke your so-called chains. Now, what, now that is the simpler of the two conspiracy theories. The other form, the Ordo Pacificanus, is what we'll call it, on the word pacification, is the one that I believe that is much more dangerous, especially for those who exist within gun culture. And its key, its crux, is what it produces. 
pacification. Now hear me out. For years we have heard people talk about evil orders. And in this example, we're going to go to the we're we're going to draw on an amalgamation idea of all of the white hot center ideas that we oftentimes see listed as conspiracy theories. Let's start with or let's use the example of the Illuminati. Now, you might have heard of a straw man fallacy where you prop up an artificial version of your opponent's argument, one that is deliberately weak and perhaps even a bad representation of their argument just so you can knock it down. This is the, the idea of a straw man argument or the straw man fallacy is, if nothing less, a social faux pas amongst people who engage in rhetoric and reason. But it can extend to the level of being a fallacy which would, in the right circles of the right people who believe or, or, or engaging in philosophical debate, uh, disqualify you from the conversation. In fact, a person, an uncouth man who very regularly engages in straw man fallacies, will most likely un find himself uninvited to certain parties. But let's draw on the idea, or let's define this Ordo Pacificanus version of a conspiracy theory as what I call, and what I, I refer to as the straw lord fallacy. Not the straw man, the straw lord fallacy. And it, once again, is a worldview. Imagine ordering the entire universe, all of the, or all of human interactions, ordering all of mankind not between just two ideas but three you've in in our um in our first one our kind of cultural marxism conspiracy theory all of mankind is ordered between the oppressors and the oppressed and they are given different moral category moral categories and also different moral positions but in this example in the straw lord theory think about some of the uh, most influential movies that have come out in the last 50 years. In this case, we're going to call on Star Wars and Lord of the Rings. <clears throat> now, the Straw Lord fallacy orient organizes the world into not two categories of people, but three. You have the great bulb of the normies, and they live under the thumb of the evil overlords. They live under the misguidance and the the manipulation and the propaganda of the illuminati the bad guy whoever the bad guys are they can be the illuminati or them or the mainstream media or whatever it is that you want to use as your big bad guy the you know certain families with certain names or even if when we stretch into certain other areas it gets a little mm, racially dicey but a straw lord fallacy begins by orienting the world into three categories. And we've already brought up two of them. You have the normies, the bad guys, and the enlightened. Or we could say the normies, the Sith, and the Jedi. The normies, the evil, you know, whatever, the, the Illuminati, and the enlightened. The, those who are not under the spell of the dark lord and so though and, and the important factor here in this type of um, fallacy is that the normies don't know or probably don't know that they are under the spell the misinformation the whatever the 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 manipulation the propaganda of the bad guys they might not even realize or know that the quote-unquote bad guys exist and it is important, though, because in this worldview, lo and behold, we have the good guys. We have the Jedi or the Enlightenment, and they see through the manipulation. They see through the web of lies for what the world really is, and they are working so hard to uh, convince the normies to wake up. Now, you have heard this language many times, the Enlightened. They, they, you need to become enlightened or woke or wake up. You need to wake up to what's going on. Maybe, maybe people will wake up and see what's really going on. This language permeates so much of our culture, and I'm not just talking about gun culture, I'm talking about well beyond that, about if only the normies knew what I knew, we would be in a different place. And the 
way, the way that this type of fallacy, being the strong Lord fallacy, can grip a person is not through how rational or reasonable it sounds, but for the sense of meaning and purpose and oftentimes belonging that it promises. If you only see through the lies, you will be part of a secret order of good guys who are fighting against the bad guys. Except for they're not fighting. Rarely, if ever, are they fighting against the bad guys. What ends up being the case, and this is what I think we find distasteful about this type of conspiracy theorist, is that they spend all their effort and energy and motivation and passion trying to convince you to see the world through their eyes. And the bigger, and this is where this, this sense of, um, this is where that appeal to emotion really takes hold of somebody, is that the bigger the present, presumed evil guy is, the, whether it's your Illuminati or your secret families, or the bigger and more powerful the bad guy is, simultaneously, without saying so, it implies that must be how powerful the good guys are as well, or at least how intelligent or enlightened or woke they are as well. So, this type of conspiracy theory, which, is, which I refer to as the straw lord fallacy, hinges on organizing all the all of mankind or all of the people in their worldview into th one of three camps they are either the normies who or they are they are they are the normies who are under the spell of the bad guys the evil illuminati the dark wizard whatever and then uh, separate to both of those you have the enlightenment who have broken free from the chains of their manipulation and the stronger the bad guy is, the stronger the good guys must also be, because the stronger the manipulation, the more, the more strength it takes to break free from the manipulation. The more crafty and ingrained into our society the manipulation is, the more intelligent and inspired the free thinkers truly are. Are. And now you can look back at many films and movies and videos, whether it comes to things like Maze Runner, Equilibrium, The Matrix, Lord, uh, not Lord of the Rings, um, to some extent uh, the older Star Wars films. And you can see this recreating theme over and over and over again. 1984, to even another extent, Fahrenheit 451. Uh, even crazier, or not you as well, you have Brave New World. This concept, if you could organize the world into the manipulators, the manipulated, and the free thinkers, congratulations, you might be suffering from the effects of what this kind of um, conspiracy theory will do to you. It is an appeal to emotion, and it is a, an appeal to emotion that, for so far as what we're talking about, doesn't require any action. It might inspire action. It might give a sense of urgency to one situation, or it might order and make sense that sense of urgency that already exists. But what you find and how you can decipher one of these as not a genuine belief, but in this sense, a conspiracy theory, is that it requires nothing. Imagine you could, you have, imagine you were there, um, in your home and you hear a knock on your door and sure enough a man in a robe knocks on the door and he's like and, and, and he's got the you know the beard and the wizard and it's like it's like a gandalf character right imagine if gandalf was talking to frodo baggins um in the beginning of the lord of the rings and he this is after he had determined that the ring in frodo's possession was the one ring imagine if all he said that frodo needed to do was to believe that the one ring was the one ring, not go take it to the fires of Mount Doom and destroy it. Or imagine another example of a small town, a microcosm example, where there you come to discover that not only uh, is the town, the, the town leadership completely corrupt, immoral on all levels, participating in human atrocities, and not only do you discover that, but you also discover that there has been a small group of people who are the resistance against that. 
And what is more important is the, what, what tends in this story to be more important is the identity of the resistance, not the resistance that they're doing. In other words, they just have to resist the tyranny or whatever that is. And so this so-called resistance is more of an identity, a banner, or the, or in, even in this story, it's just an aesthetic. It's just what you look like. It's just what you identify as. I identify as the resistance to the regime. Are you resisting them? Well, I don't believe the propaganda. That doesn't qualify as resistance. We have heard it said, if you are familiar with one of the theological questions that come from the New Testament, which is that of the phrase, faith without works is dead. A conspiracy theory, in this sense, becomes corrupt it is a danger to the believer when all that it requires is faith, but no works. On the first hand, the first type of conspiracy theory that we brought up, the danger was, is this is the example of the, the cultural Marxism, where you have the oppressors and the oppressed. The danger that this type of conspiracy theory has against the individual, and I'm not talking about uh, government involvement or anything like that, I am talking simply what it does to a person is it elevates one's sense of self-importance to that of near or actual godhood. Because one is oppressed, they then self-identify as the Messiah even without saying it. They are part of the, the oppressed class. The danger that the second type of conspiracy theory has for the believer is that it becomes nothing but a sense of moral masturbation. It is this never-ending hamster wheel of urgency and discovering the truth that never leads to meaningful action. You are justified in passively not resisting in any meaningful way because you would be squashed. But if only those pesky normies understood, then we could have our resistance. And this is how both of these types of conspiracy theories are a danger to you. It either creates fervor without wisdom or uh, faith without works. And so, if you share this, thank you. Leave a comment. You can find us on Spotify and Apple, and you can find us on YouTube, and for now at least, and Rumble. And thank you for listening to this episode of the Redacted Culture Cast. If you want to hear more and be part of the conversation on gun culture and what we are working on, you can find us here and at redactedllc.com. Now go forth and conquer. Mm -hmm.